the official position will be president and chief executive officer. And it's sort of a natural extension of what I've been doing all my life. It's an extension of a certain pattern that I've sent. It seems to be sort of inevitable, sort of a move in a way for me. When I got into the, first of all, when I went into the, to the, got to the point of choosing careers, I remember as if it were yesterday. I was trained by Misha Mishakov, the famed concertmaster, Toscanini's band. Sure, in Detroit. This is just after he'd left New York, Toscanini, <clears throat> and Paul Perry wanted to build the symphony. Had a very bad time for a while. And this was his mission in 1952 to bring it back. So he got the top man, and Toscanini was <clears throat> feelings at that time that he may not be conducting all that much longer, and mm-hmm. and I guess, I don't know what prompted his decision, but it's for 15 years with Toscanini, but mm-hmm. he'd be willing to try it. So he went, and I went with him when I was a youngster. And so while training with him... Had you been living in New York? No, I'd been living in Syracuse, my hometown, but my father had taken me down to New York from time to oh, time. My sure. father was a great fan. My father was an engineer. Yeah. <clears throat> always very into recording and all the electronic kind of stuff that was his field. So we had one of the first radios, one of the first TV sets, one of the first record cutters. He had a record cutter in the house. Oh, really? And he, you should see the discs that he has now, these big 16-inch platters that he cut himself of all the New York Philharmonic and NBC and all these broadcasts, all live stuff. So <clears throat> he became sort of a fan mm-hmm. of Mishakov. He heard him play so many solos and he just liked it a lot. He was a big Toscanini fan. Mm-hmm. So he saw to it that he met him and that I played for him and so on and so forth. So I worked in Syracuse for a while with Louis Krasner and with Myron Levy, a local local man. And then Louis Krasner, is, uh, you probably have heard of. Uh, yeah, he's a, he's a fine pedagogue. And <coughs> so he was very much involved with that. And my father kept me in touch with Mishakov and decided that when Mishakov said that I should come to him, I would go to him. So when Misha made the move to Detroit, he said, I'd like to take David with me and we'll find a family for him, etc. Et the reason I bring this up is because my orientation from the association, I was 11. So my, I left home when I was 11 to pursue this course. It was an interesting time, too, because before my parents would agree to it, well, they wanted it for me, but before they would really go into it in a totally committed way, I had to make a decision whether I was going to go into sports or not, because I was a real sports hotshot <laughs> at 11. <laughs> and I was playing in league four or five years older than I was in town. So, I mean, they, I guess they just couldn't see justifying this kind of an investment, which was considerable, with me going on a baseball field and breaking all my fingers. So it was very interesting, and I remember that also, Jeff, they asked, you know, which is it going to be? And then I very consciously said, oh, I worked and worked through sort of the formative, formative years of my life. I was, you know, later on, I went to a marvelous high school there, Cass High School, which had an orchestra of extraordinary sophistication. And a lot of famous players that you would know if I mentioned their names came from there. And it was just a, a, a nucleus of a lot of talent. Detroit always had a lot of talent in it, and this orchestra was there. So I was concertmaster of the orchestra and played lots of solos with it, this and that, chamber music, and I sort of role modeled my teacher because he was a concertmaster and he played some solos. And so I guess when I went to Curtis, so I did my years at Curtis, and when I was at Curtis, it was sort of natural that I continued in that sort of same sort of role. I didn't have much money. I had to put myself self in school, so I played all the orchestra jobs in town. Around here. Around here, of which there were many at that time, and eventually was concertmaster in nearly all of them, including the Curtis Orchestra. It just seemed, I mean, that just seemed to be where I just would, the court would somehow bob up to that that surface, and that's where I where I was. So I guess it was pretty much assumed that my life would be a concertmaster somewhere, mm-hmm. is where where that I would go. To be the it just seemed to be the direction. Also, well, isn't, doesn't Curtis give full tuition? Or yes. Yeah. They still do. That? Yeah, but I had, I had no living expenses. But I, I, had to, yeah, I had to work for my living expenses. I would play a job and then go and practice till two, three, four in the morning and down in the boiler rooms and. Because we had, you know, classes the next day and so on. But anyway, when it came time to graduate, it was very interesting. I had two simultaneous, very good opportunities to pursue. One was an opening in a really good orchestra, and another was an opening in a really good school. So I took both auditions. The orchestra audition 
went well, and it just forced me to think a little bit of where that might take me. And then the Oberlin, which was the school, went very well. And that forced me to think a little bit too, because I did like teaching. And I liked the idea of more options for me. I liked that seemed my role model from that point of view, from variety, sort of one out. And I decided, look, I have a string quartet there, and I'd be able to teach. And um, probably would have a certain amount of flexibility with my hours. A certain amount of, you know, the school calendar is not as rigid as some other calendars, for sure. And um, I don't know, it just seemed to me to be an opportunity to be more creative, and to get involved in some things that, that I might like to, that would might give me the time to do it. So I decided to go that route. <clears throat> when I got there, I immediately found that in the quartet, teaching a lot, and then I got involved in committees, a lot of committee work, and I found this to be really interesting. I really got interested in how all this stuff works, and some of my friends were people who were plugged in one way or another into some sort of administrative duties and decisions and this kind of thing, and I was always fascinated by it. And then I w was uh, involved at uh, Dartmouth Congregation of the Arts, which was a marvelous festival, headed by Mario Van de Bonaventura. I don't know if you ever heard of that. That was, was that probably really the Anthony de Bonaventura? Yeah, it's his brother. Yeah. And Mario's concept was to bring together, it was, it was fairly, at the time there weren't as many festivals, and it was pretty exciting. We had composers come there, and we played their works, and so there was all this stuff, and teaching. And this was in the summer? In the summer, at Dartmouth. And then I found myself getting somewhat involved in some, I would help out with some of the teaching schedules, and this, that, and whatever. And then subsequently I went to Meadowmount, and again, was involved in helping Mr. Galamian with some of the programming and some of the this and some of the that. And he put me on the board of directors there, mm -hmm. which is a society for strings and so forth. And anyway, the big... Is that, is that getting into making decisions about budgets? And well, it's sort of, I mean, when you go to the board meeting, yeah, it's involved. Leading up to that. Yeah, 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 leading up to that. And so then what happened is like Victor called and asked us to come and head the department mm -hmm. in Cleveland. And that's when, at that point, 69. no, that was in 71. So um, then we realized, wow, this is pretty heavy duty because I mean, we're going to be really responsible for building a class. And so there were a lot of administrative things that just kept coming up all the time. And I enjoyed doing it, master classes, this and that. And then in 74, and then in 74, I decided to take the plunge and with the support of the Institute was to have my own seminar, my own thing. And it was wonderful. There was a lot of support for the Cleveland Chamber Music Seminar. Mm -hmm. The only thing was that I found that I was the one who sort of had to do everything. Mm -hmm. I had a lot of support, but I had to spearhead everything. Lots of people ready to applaud. Ready to applaud and ready to support. The initiative had to come. So that's a key thing. Initiative. And that's the key, yeah. The, the key thing is the initiative. So I found that if I would initiate something and if I would draw some people together and organize a meeting and get people to, you know, to have a meeting of the minds and this and that, that things could happen. We could raise money, we could do this, we could do that. And I got involved in the whole process of fundraising. I got in the process of, because we wanted to make this thing pay for itself mm -hmm. uh, without severely conflicting with other things that the Institute was doing. So, you know, you had to go to different people, you had to go to different places that had different emphasis anyway, where the Institute wouldn't normally be able to get it, or people in the community who just really liked it a lot and who wanted to get involved. That's why we had people with the kids play at their homes and this kind of stuff, because the community. I wanted to get the community involved, and what I realized was... And give the program an identity of its own. Exactly. I wanted to keep that... Yes, I wanted to keep it as self-sufficient in a certain way, with its, as you said, with its own identity. That it would, that kind it of would, apart from the institute. Yes, but, but very much a part of it. But, yeah. Like an individual member of a family, but mm -hmm. but part of a family, mm -hmm. part, of, part of the school, but with its own identity. With its, that became an enormous job, really enormous. And I would start working on the next seminar already the next year. But what interested me in it was bringing together so many different elements. 
What I liked about the seminar was that it brought together the faculty, it brought together the community, it brought together the Cleveland Orchestra, and we brought brought the Board of Trustees into it. They got very much involved in it too. And we also got involved with the nation. I mean, these were students from all over the country. So it was a real putting together of a lot of different elements as sort of the ultimate bring this all together and to try to homogenize it or at least to make it coordinate or network with itself in such a way that it would produce something perhaps greater than the sum of its parts. The most important factor of it being, however, above all, educationally sound. The important thing is that the 50 people who are here have to come away having had an educational experience that they couldn't get anywhere else. Not that the teachers were any better, but that the environment was such I mean, they were the, we took the best talent and the best teachers and put them together in what I thought was the best possible mm -hmm. atmosphere. So we'd have the Cleveland Orchestra people play with them, and we'd have them play with people's homes, and we'd have them coached very severely, and we'd have the Guarneri come in and work with them. But the idea was put all of these elements, which could just chaotic mess, into something that would, in fact, harmonize together and, mm -hmm. and, and in itself sort of be a chamber music, piece of chamber music of people. Mm -hmm. It happened because they came away going, I can't believe these people in Cleveland. I don't. I mean, they're so incredible. I mean, they, they're so responsive, and and they commented on the organization that it was really well organized. Everybody was plugging for them. The audiences were always full, and mm -hmm. it just became something that they really got excited about. And of course, the coaching of Mr. Schneider and Joe Gingold, and all the coaches at the institute with Bernie and uh, Bob Vernon, Steve Gaber, and on and on and on. And they really, they really took off, and it was really exciting. So that was my thing. I mean, that really was was my baby, and and uh, it really did, as far as where I live, administratively, where I live professionally, it really brought all of the ingredients that are important to me together. Mm -hmm. It's important to me the quality of the music. This is really important. It's important to me the quality of the students and the earnest. When I say quality, I mean the earnestness of it what they're trying to do as well. I mean, there's uh, the seriousness mm -hmm. of the students and, the, and the, the dedication, kind of, that they have to this music. I certainly had it at 11. I didn't mm -hmm. go around thinking about it every day of my life when I was 11, but when I think back on it, I really never wanted to do anything else. I mean, I loved sports, but I could understand this idea that I had to commit myself at some point. Uh, I just couldn't just be frivolous about it. That the, my environment is very important to me. Uh, the quality of the life around me, my friends and, and the musicians with whom I'm associating. The, my faculty has always been, been very important to me. I've always had a, wanted to always have a good relationship with my colleagues. It's something I stress very heavily with my students as well. It's that there's just more to this than just being able to sit down and play the notes, but being able to interact with your colleagues in a meaningful way so that you can get things from each other is really important. It's, it's an important way to grow and to deal with people in the community. So I start to see these elements and it started to make sense to me that this is... David, it's what you're saying that you want to build something, you want to create something, you want to build something. Yeah. Right. And this is how you're... Right. These are the ingredients. These are my, my blocks, my building blocks. I want to be part of something that if somebody else were around creating, I mean, I would sit back and admire it. But if I, if I think that there's a room for something that I feel need, can and need be done and nobody's doing it, I'll do it. I'm, I'm, not, I'm not a workaholic in the sense that I've just got to find something to do to busy myself because I've got a free hour. Um, it's in response to a need. Yeah, it, it, as I see it, it is, yes. Well, when Curtis, when Mr. Glomian passed away, they invited me to come and assume his duties. Now this was something from the point of view of the career that I was in, which is a great compliment. I mean, this is the top of the top. This is the cream of everything. And this is an opportunity for me to, as well as an acknowledgement of my skills as a teacher and a pedagogue and a person who can work with youth and, and so on, that it was an opportunity that I simply couldn't turn down. As possible. Besides which, I was being asked to coordinate all the chamber music activities at the Institute. I was at, uh, Curtis. at Curtis. I'm the only full-time violin teacher that they've had here. And so for me to move from Cleveland, it's not just a matter of teaching a few students, but it would have to be more. So I got involved in administrative duties, namely the chamber music organization. Um, also, I've helped in the area of coordinating the piano majors into the accompanying areas. We have accompanying program, but we have the piano managers and getting them involved. <laughs> I need it like that. 
So here I am again, you see, involved in a lot of administrative things and so on. And then I felt that perhaps the one area, in order to stay sort of well-rounded in all of this, the one area that I wasn't doing as much in as I might have liked was the performance area. In the meantime, I'm doing a lot of master classes, a lot of traveling. So the opportunity for the Canterbury Trio came along, and I thought that it might be really nice to be able to, to do some, I think I had enough time to do some chamber music along the way, and so we got involved with them very heavily. Who are the other members? Jennifer Langham is the cellist, she's a cellist in New York, and Ann Epperson. I don't know if you know, do you know Ann by any chance? Um, she, she was married, no, she was married to Serge Luca. And Jennifer Langham, by the way, is married to Nathaniel Rosen. Oh. So it's, it just happened to be there. So we we met. I met through Jenny actually, and she they had had this trio, the Canterbury Trio, and they needed a violinist, a former violinist, was leading. So I said, you know, well, it might really be interesting. They were asking if I knew a student or someone serious who might be interested, and I said, well, I might myself. I'd like to come and play. So I came and played with the gals, and it was just terrific. I mean, they're they're both terrific, and, and uh, it worked really well. It clicked very nicely. And more importantly, had my wife's blessing. <laughs> she came and did a balance check real really early on. <laughs> you know, just just to check the balance. I understand. <laughs> Make sure the phrasing is yes. together, but not too together. Not too together. <laughs> so that worked out really well. So here I was already now sitting here with teaching the violin, doing some playing, doing some administrating, involved with the chamber music group, involved in a board of directors, the Chamber Music America. I got very heavily involved with that, sitting on the board of directors at Metamount. I was a director at Metamount. I was one of three directors there, four directors there, running the whole school after Mr. Galanian died. I see. So I got very much involved in all of that. And Chamber Music America out of where? New York, yeah. That's becoming a very important national uh, force in chamber music. Uh, this is, a, this is a first class oh, group. Up here in Chicago this month, I think. Yeah, I th is there a convention or something there? No, it's going to be one of you. Oh, I don't know. Okay. Uh, David Klein is the president there now. You know David from Cleveland? Or he's on the, I'm sorry, he's chairman of the board. I think Heidi Castleman uh, is president. Anyway, <coughs> so there I was involved in all this stuff I know. And really very happy and very satisfied. And then, out of nowhere, I get a phone call. I say, well, I'm very flattered, and I love Cleveland, I love the school, and all the things that happened there, but I'm very satisfied. Where I am. And what started as from a colleague, first one came from a colleague, I think, in Cleveland. And what started for, for out the position. for the position, would I be interested in it? Would I be interested in taking the, first the institute presidency? Yeah. I'm very happy where I am. There's, I was flattered, but I wasn't thinking yeah. in that term at all. Not at all. And I know that the institution has been having a lot of trouble and a lot of problems. And, you know, I mean, that's, that's serious business. Yeah, I mean, that's all very serious business. The whole conservatory scene, I mean, and across yeah. the country and everything is serious. And, you know, I'm sitting there knowing that if, if there are going to be a few conservatories left, surely I'm sitting in one of them that's going to be one of those that's going to be left. Uh, I mean, the, inst the Curtis Institute is, is going to, you know, it's going to be around for a while. Yeah. And, and I hope Cleveland, too. But, I mean, I know that there's a big, you know, these things flash in front of you and you go, phew. Who knows? Yeah. You know, there's a lot of trouble. Anyway, what started out is some isolated sort of mumblings and some inquiries and informal things, and then the calls just started to pour in. I mean, just poured in, and they poured in from Cleveland Orchestra people, poured in from institute faculty, poured in from institute trustees, poured it in from the community, people out at large, and the point is that it became somewhat of a of a mandate. It's the only way I could just think of it. I mean, this is this is overwhelming that there is this kind of support for me to take this on. And then I started little by little to look at it a little bit differently. And I said to myself, sort of, with all the support, all the calls coming in, that that would give you the kind of support that you would want and need to have if you were going to do a good job. Which Without any doubt. You want to know, can I, you know, can I do this? Absolutely. And some very encouraging words from people who said that they wanted to stay there and help. So I started to look at it little by little and said, it sort of boiled down to, does the human being have a right to turn down such an extraordinary opportunity for growth and to contribute something? something important to, to a lot of people. I mean, this is a very important institution. 
It's got a great heritage. It's in a wonderful city. I mean, the music, especially the musical part, that city has taken such a bad rap, and it's it's had its problems, but there's nothing wrong with that city. It's musically one of the most vital, one of the most sophisticated, enthusiastic. And, and they seem to love the Institute. I don't know what the trouble, I mean. I mean and supportive of all the arts that are there. I mean, it's it's really important to the people there. And this I saw along through the seminar. So I knew when these people were saying this, I knew that, that it could be, I mean, because I know that it functions that way in Cleveland. So that if people really were supportive and wanted to help, they can. Anyway, we started to think more and more and more. There is no lateral move for me whatsoever. There was no lateral move for me. I was in the top position in the top school, period. That was what made it very difficult because I loved it here. I really do. And I didn't want I didn't want to betray the trust that my students had in me, the trust the school has in me. I mean this is an important position. And yet on the other hand I saw an opportunity to to do something very important. And this is the way I see it now. So I started to think about what are the ingredients? And what, what, what do I have here? What are the possibilities? And I believe, Jeff, so firmly in this concept of, I've coined the word for it now, for, for, I mean, I'm just in search of a word, I'm, for networking, bringing together of a whole bunch of forces, bringing the Cleveland Orchestra people who are on our faculty and who are so, so supportive, to bring the faculty together and to let them communicate with each other, to the, let the town get involved in this, let the board of trustees get involved in it, let some outside, bring some outside people in, involved, get them involved in time too. But what I felt and still feel is that if I can get this faculty, and I see the faculty sort of as a, a horizontal arm, if I can get this thing to network freely with itself, which it's not been doing, and or it has actually done that better because it hasn't been able to network with the vertical side of it, with the administrative side of it. They've been frustrated there. And they haven't been able to, to cross network so that their network actually gotten a lot better. But what I decided was that what I needed to do was to get a healthy unit there with the administration and with the faculty. And that if I could sort of get this console network so that it was free within itself, so that it could communicate that if I could find out what people's hopes and dreams really are, to be able to just sit down and say, you know, everybody lives with this voice going on in their head all the time. What is your voice telling you? What would you like to do? What is what important to you in life? And to be able to just sit down, take some time, and try to find out what, why are people here with each faculty member? You know, why, why are you here? There are a lot of people there. They're not there for the money. They're, they're there. There's some people that have been there. There's just extraordinary dedication. So if I can get this to start to percolate, then I find that what I've got is a healthy sort of a console into which I'd like to plug the community. That's my peripheral, mm -hmm. as it were. And to see then if I can bring in other elements and, and have the board of trustees feel a part of this and have the community feel a part of this sort of really like the seminar, and therefore create something that's greater than the sum of its parts. Synergy, is that the word? Synergistic, I yes, heard the word yes, used. Yes, yeah. What's it's, what? it's, I'm really excited about, and that support, and I've had some pretty high-level meetings already, and I don't sense anything except tremendous willingness to want to work together. Mm -hmm. And I sense this support from top to bottom. I sense that there's a, that the people involved with the institution really feel that that institution is important. And I think it's important too. And, um, you know, I don't know if I can do this. I really don't know if I can do this. But I, I really do feel confident that if you can put all of that energy together, all that creative power together and make it work together, it's got to produce something important. Are you thinking of specific programs or policies? Or policies are, uh, again, to network policies to, to use the network that we've created in 25 years of teaching with teachers who have sent us students over all these years and with students who will be sending us students over all these years. Sort of going on that concept that we've the teachers have been pleased with the work that we've done with their student over all these years. They've come back improved. Mm -hmm. They've come back happy. They've come back, in many cases, with spouses uh, who've met at our school. They've come back feeling good about the way they were educated. 
And that's as important to a teacher as, a, as, a, as where you send your school to a parent. You know, there comes a time when we want to send them away. We need to send them away. They want to know what. And the important thing is we want to send them to some place that we really feel comfortable, where we can relax and say, I feel comfortable with you there. I know you're going to be well taken care of. By coming to the institute. By coming to the institute. You want to create this feeling about the school uh, to not only to get students, but to get good students and students that, are gonna, that will do well there and want to be there. Right. It's a very much of a family sort of a situation that I want to create. That's always the way I've worked. That's where I've always worked best. It's when everybody knows everybody by name, when everybody's been able to function and, and function freely with, with anyone else, nobody feeling that they can't communicate with one another. You want the faculty to feel connected with each other. And that's part yeah, very of much so, yes. That's and it would be expressed in more performances, changing the performances together, or is it just a... Nothing necessarily that concrete or that, you know, that limited. It, it hopefully will be in whatever ways they feel they need more communication. That's, that's what is, we have yet to find out. What are the ways that this cumulative force, this cumulative artistic force, wants to move? How do they see the institution? And, and I'm not asking them to, what I'm asking them to do is to, is to be open and to express their ideas and their hopes. And hopefully, what I might be able to do is to, is to connect them together into something, into something that will be up an important force. But first of all, to get a sense of what each faculty person, your colleagues in a sense, and why they're there, what they might do, and uh, see how you can shape things based on that. Based on that. Mm -hmm. Also, I, I want to I want to be responsive to a community that is so dedicated to that school. They want something too. Yeah. And they want to be part of something. Why do they want to be a part of this? Mm -hmm. But they do. When important things happen there, there's never any problem getting the community to come, come in there in droves. So I think that they need to know that they're important to us also. Because I do think the com community is very important mm -hmm. to us, both as a microcosm and as a macrocosm. I mean, I think that if one gets a little bit more global in the concept of this whole networking, mm -hmm. there's no, re no reason that it can't apply in larger and larger circles mm -hmm. outside of Cleveland. I think it's a natural for the city that is wholly sort of trying to put itself back together. Mm -hmm. You know, it, it, it is doing that, to want to plug into an institution that's pretty much already there. I mean, mm -hmm. the Institute has a fine reputation, and it's a positive Mm -hmm. reflection on the, on the city and I can see that mm -hmm. even from that point of view that there's no reason why the city can't mm -hmm. take pride in this venture if we know that let them know that we want them to be part of it also mm -hmm. it, it's not perhaps it's not as idealistic as it may sound I mean it can it, when you get right down to the nitty-gritty of it how how are contacts made I mean isn't it strange that you bump into someone on a plane that you know and that person happens to be involved over here and that you're writing a, a, a uh -huh. instrumental and I just happened to be in talking with Vitya, just saying, Vitya, let's talk. And only to her, I said, hey, you know something? It's interesting. Mm -hmm. Jeff's here. And, and uh, um, it just... Chance. Almost. Chance. <laughs> and how the trio came into being. Jenny and I were judging a contest together. Isn't that networking? Yeah. I mean, isn't yeah. that... Two things get together and they say, hey, why don't we join up? Mm -hmm. Let's look for a console, some place to plug into. Mm -hmm. and, and make something happen. Make something happen. That's what chamber music is all about. Mm -hmm. That's exactly what it's all about, is the bringing together of elements. Yeah, it could almost be an analogy, I suppose, for, I don't know, <laughs> for running a... So it's the ultimate chamber music experience. Yeah, maybe, I guess. It really, in a way, is. <laughs> I mean, you've played chamber music enough to know what that means when you just hear, when you just pick up on something that somebody else just played, you know? The board of trustees yeah, over here. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And I want everyone to know how important they are to all of this. And what's important to me is that I'm not telling them that it's important to them. They've told me. Mm -hmm. that it's important to them. That's the mandate That's idea. That's the mandate that, idea. Yeah. And so, you know, I wanted to know that I feel the same way, and I feel so much the same way that I've decided to mm -hmm. to make the decision that I've made to go and, and uh, repay, perhaps, some of this extraordinary support that I've had mm -hmm. while we were there and, and that we had in the asking, and to create something important and do something really rather important. Uh, we may want some more tea or something. Oh, you can still get more. Yeah. Um, 
Because they haven't assumed officially the director. Particular new programs or things in place yet? Are you going to kind of go with what is sort of initially? You will go with what is initially because the kind of make something happen. That's what chamber music is all about. Mm -hmm. That's exactly what it's all about. It's the bringing together of elements. So it could almost be an analogy, I suppose, for, for running a. a it's the ultimate yeah, chamber music experience. Yeah, maybe. Okay. It really, in a way, is. <laughs> I mean, you've played chamber music enough to know what that means when you just hear, when you just pick up on something that somebody else just played, you know? The board of trustees yeah, over yeah, here. Yeah, yeah. And I want everyone to know how important they are to all of this. And what's important to me is that I'm not telling them that it's important to them. They've told me mm -hmm. that it's important to them. That's the mandate idea. That's the mandate. Yeah. And so, you know, I wanted to know that I feel the same way, and I feel so much the same way that I've decided to, to make the decision that I've made to go and, and uh, repay perhaps some of this extraordinary support that I've had while we were there and, and that we had in the asking, and to create something important and do something really rather important. Well, we may want some more tea or something. I'll, yeah. Yeah, well, definitely. Do you have any particular new, because you haven't assumed officially the director? You will go with what is initially, because the kind of thing that I'm talking about doesn't require necessarily new forces. Right, that's what I was saying. It requires, uh, I think the policies are going to have to come out of the blue, come out of all, yes, I have some, some ideas, but the ideas are not startling in any way. I want to get, um, I want fine faculty to continue to come to augment the already fine faculty that we have. There are some areas that I, I want to pay some particular attention in, and we'll, we'll do so as time goes on and see how the people I might be thinking might, about might fit into this family mm -hmm. and how the family might, you know, work for them. I think the